Hello, everybody. My name is Derek Demeter. I'm with the Emil Bueller Planetarium, and we want to welcome you to our virtual Women in STEAM panel. We have some amazing individuals today that are going to join you all, and we're going to be talking about some wonderful stuff. And uh, to start off, we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our moderator, who's going to be our captain today. Uh, she is an amazing woman as well. She is an analog astronaut. A vi she is the vice president of the Central Florida Astronomical Society, and she's a good friend of mine. And uh, well, with that further ado, I send it over to Trisha Smedley, and she's going to begin our Women in STEAM panel. Thank you, Derek. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you guys for showing up tonight. We have a fun night planned. We have seven incredible women for you guys to hear from. How we're going to structure tonight is we are going to start by introducing everyone. If you have a question at any time, feel free to post your question anywhere that you are viewing us right now. You can also post your question after the fact if you're viewing this uh, after, we, after it's posted. We will try to answer your question after the fact as well. So let me go ahead and start with our first uh, panelist. We have Deborah Saki, and let me tell you a little bit about Deborah here. So Dr. Saki earned her biology and bachelor's and master's degrees from Rutgers University in Camden, New Jersey. She earned a PhD from the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida, where she worked as a teaching assistant while completing her doctoral degree. Her dissertation involved conducting basic research on learning and memory and the neurobiology of aging under the mentorship of Gary Aaron Dash, PhD. She has worked as a faculty member and as a faculty advisor for the Seminole State College Environmental Clubs for close to 20 years. Her teaching experience at Seminole State College includes general biology, anatomy and physiology, and environmental science. Her favorite courses to teach are independent studies and travel study classes because they foster deep student engagement and allow her to develop novel ways to teach science. Health education and environmental advocacy are her passions. Her hobbies include traveling, hiking, and music. So will everyone help me in welcoming Dr. Deborah Saki? And we would love to hear how you came to get to how you got to where you are today, Deborah. Thank you so much, Trisha, for that introduction. So I'm going to share my screen with everyone. So can everyone see that? Hopefully you can. Yes. Okay, thank you. So what brought me to science? So I'd like to uh, be able to tell you that it was a straight path for me to get here today, but actually my path was more like a food web on the right than a food chain. So I, um, started out as a uh, communications major, not a science major. I didn't really care for science too much in high school. I liked English. I was on the school newspaper and the literary magazine. Um, so between my freshman and sophomore years in college, I interned at a magazine. And I liked the writing and learning part of that internship. But I couldn't relate to the people working there. So it wasn't a good fit for me. So um, at the same time, the college I was attending eliminated their communications degree. So I had to pick a new major. So I ended up switching schools and I attended a, um, a different private school for a semester and I was a business major. And I did fine, but I really did not enjoy the classes in the business field. So, um, I transferred again to a state school and I took a photography class there that I loved. So I was torn what to do. I reflected what were my favorite classes and those were um, nutrition, photography, um, environmental science. So I had to reflect and I evolved and I explored. So I tried a, li a lot of different things. So travel and exploration have always been my passions and I enjoyed being outdoors and swimming and um, reading about health topics. So I knew I wouldn't be happy working behind a desk at a desk job. 
So I decided to try biology. So uh, my dad advised me to stay in school. I almost dropped out of college because I just didn't know what was my right path. So my dad said, stay in school. He never had the opportunity to go to college because he was in the war and he had to support his family as the oldest boy in his family. So he emphasized the value of education and he was right. And I'm really glad I listened to my dad. So he encouraged me and he supported me when a, the school that I was at offered an opportunity to study abroad. So my friends were going, so that it, appealed to me. So this encouragement uh, from my dad was really pivotal for me. So uh, my eyes were opened to new worlds. So when I finally found that um, I started taking biology classes, I found that I enjoyed them. I, I took them out of order because by the time I decided what I wanted to do, I was out of sequence. So I took bio two before bio one, but I was determined to finish. So at the time, I was, I thought I was doing the wrong thing, but looking back, um, attending different schools was good for me because it brought in my perspective. Um, and every course that I took, I feel that help, helped me. And I still want to continue learning. And uh, teaching is a career where you never stop learning um, and making connections. So what appeals to me about science is, um, the logic and the creative thinking and the pursuit of truth through evidence. So um, they're the aspects of science that uh, appeal to me. So I enjoy making connections between science and other disciplines. And I love teaching science to college students. So I'm really happy doing what I'm doing um, now. So um, thank you. And um, I would like to pass um, the torch now to Dr. Uh, Dr. Laura, who's gonna tell you a little bit about her path. So we're colleagues at Seminole State. So Laura, it's all yours. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Laura Nesser. I'm a professor at Seminole State College. I currently teach Introduction to Earth Science, Astronomy, and Environmental Science. Um, I've been in Florida now. I just finished up my third year here and it's easily the best place I've lived. I lived, I'm from Virginia, lived in North Carolina, lived in Indiana, and then made my way down to Florida. Um, and, you know, I have some family here and we've kind of set up shops. So it's a great place to be right now. Um, just a little bit about my background is like Debbie and many others on this panel, I did not start in the STEAM field. In fact, um, when I started at Virginia Tech was my undergraduate school. I started as an English major, but I was more undecided. I just kind of went with English because I liked English in high school, but I didn't really know anything about it. <laughs> so I entered as an English major. I happened to take a geology class as an elective. And I thought, huh, okay, well, this is pretty interesting. I'll switch to geology for a major. And if I don't like it, I can switch to a different thing. And so I switched to geology uh, halfway through my freshman year. I also took my first field geology course, which opened my eyes to, oh my gosh, this is a really, really fun subject. We went, uh, Virginia Tech is nestled in the hills of the Appalachian Mountains. So for this field geology course, we went hiking every weekend in the Appalachians and learned how to do field mapping and measure orientation of rocks. And, you know, I was with a lot of like-minded people that enjoyed being outdoors. So, you know, even though I never really thought I was going to go in a science trajectory, I kind of ended up there because it landed in my lap as a random elective I took uh, my freshman year. Um, and I just want to share a few photos of my field adventures. So I'm going to go ahead and share a PowerPoint slide. Let's see. And let me just maximize it. Okay, can everyone see that slide? So this is, it's not all the pictures, of course, because I've now been in geology for let's see, since 2005. So 15 years is when I uh, started majoring in geology. Um, and the upper left is my first field geology course that I was enrolled in, a few of my friends that we went out with every weekend. Uh, in geology, you generally have to take a field camp. 
And so I chose a field camp that went to Ireland for a summer. And I spent six weeks in Ireland, uh, my junior year of college. And then the rest of the photos are all during graduate school. I went to grad school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I majored in geological sciences. My dissertation was out in Northwestern Wyoming, which is what most of these photos are, including my virtual background photo is <laughs> from Wyoming as well. Um, and then in the top right is a field class that I got to take. So as I said, um, you know, it wasn't my first path, but it certainly was the best path that I could take. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Laura. So next we are going to Zoe Landsman. So let me tell you a little bit about Zoe Landsman. So Dr. Zoe Landsman received, received her Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from the University of Central Florida in 2011. She received her PhD in Physics with a concentration in Planetary Science in 2017. Dr. Landsman was a postdoctoral scholar at the Florida, Insti Florida Space Institute from 2000. 2017 to 2019. She now works as a scientist at UCF. Her research focuses on rocky bodies in the solar system, especially asteroids. These objects tell us about the formation and the history of the solar system, and they are key, they are a key part of plans for human space exploration. So let's everyone welcome Zoe, and let's hear about your story, Zoe. Sure, well, uh, thanks for that introduction, and thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing, uh, I have just a couple of pictures to share. Um, let's see. So this first set of pictures um, is, these are some pictures of me at work. Um, and this actually makes my job uh, look much more glamorous than it is. But, uh, but the work I do um, is cool. Sometimes I get to use a uh, telescope. Sometimes I get to work in a lab. Um, but most of the time, I'm actually just in front of my computer, uh, either analyzing data or writing papers or writing proposals to get uh, funding and other resources to do um, to do more uh, more research. Um, but I wanted to show you kind of uh, some snapshots of what uh, what my job looks like, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how I got here. So um, so it's it's been really cool actually so far to hear everybody's stories because mine is. Um, I think I think I had there are some similarities here. So I was also not one of those people that like always knew from the time I was a little child that I wanted to be a scientist. Um, I in fact I kind of believed pretty truly that I was not a science person. Um, and you know I liked science, but I just couldn't relate to the idea of like being you know some mad genius in a white lab coat. And I didn't personally know anybody who was a scientist, and it just seemed like you know, something completely uh, out of my experience. Um, so I was an English major when I went to, uh, when I started college. Um, but I found that I was really enjoying my, uh, my kind of intro level, you know, general education um, science classes much more than my English classes and felt all this passion for them. Um, and it wasn't until I, uh, it, well, and I'll also say it was especially astronomy and physics that I was interested in. Um, and I was, but I was really intimidated by the thought of majoring in physics um, and especially all the math that I would have to do because uh, I, you know, kind of having written off this idea of doing science as a career, I took the minimum amount of math that one could take in the state of Florida to pass high school. Um, but once I actually, you know, got some good mentoring and met physicists, um, I, I slowly began to have this shift uh, in my perspective. Um, and I, I kind of, uh, similar to, to, uh, to Laura, I was like, oh, well, you know, I'll try it. I'll major in physics and we'll see where it goes. Um, and, and it, it turned out, it turned out to go well. Um, and the shift that I had was, uh, kind of learning that there really isn't a science person. Like that's not, you're not just born, uh, with the innate ability to do science. Science is a way of thinking critically and creatively and it's a set of skills that you have to learn and practice right so like you don't pick up a guitar and immediately <laughs> know how to be a virtuoso right you have to you have to practice these things um 
And so here's my second um, set of pictures. So the other thing was, you know, I couldn't relate to being a scientist. So I wanted to share some pictures just from my, um, from my, you know, kind of outside of work life to show that scientists really are just like well-rounded people with hobbies and interests and spouses and friends. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not like the Big Bang Theory where we're, where we're caricatures. Um, so that's the end of my story. Thanks for listening. Thank you for that, Zoe. So now for something completely different, we are transitioning to Ginger Lee. So let me tell you <clears throat> a little bit about Ginger. So Ginger, AKA Synthstruct, is an interactive experience designer who combines elements of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, data, and data with audio composition and the creation of responsive and immersive visual spaces. These work spans from creating and performing full dome audiovisual experiences to developing interactive installations for science centers, festivals, and museums. She also organizes and presents workshops on creative coding, interactive design, and methods of visualizing sound, as well as talks on synesthesia, biohacking, and somatics. With an interest in how we connect with the world around us, as well as the worlds of our imagination, Lee works with different sen sensors and controllers to explore how we interact with and explore these worlds. So thank you very much, Ginger, for joining us. And let's hear your story. Hey, thank you, Trisha. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and share my screen. Give me one second. Can you guys see that? Can you guys see my screen? No. Oh, you can't. Okay. Um, now? Yes. Great. All right. Um, so as mentioned, I'm an interactive experience designer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what exactly that is. Because most people have no idea when you say interactive experience designer what that is. Um, I'm also going to talk um, a little bit about myself, but mostly about what I do as an interactive experience designer. So quick tidbits about myself. I grew up in Phoenix. I currently live in Orlando. I'm a human. Uh, I obscure things about myself. I have a magnet in my finger that lets me feel electromagnetic fields. I'm synesthetic, as Trisha mentioned in the intro. Uh, and also my dreams are basically my second life. So dreams are really important to me. I dream very vividly every night and that's a big part of who I am because uh, I do weird things like speak other languages in my dreams and have completely different uh, life that I exist in in my sleep. So dreams are a very big part of my creative life as well. Um, I'm going to really quick just change the resolution on this. I wanted to show you guys just a little bit about what I do as an interactive experience designer. Um, so these are some projects I did. These are all from 2019. Um, so all projects I did last year. So I do a mix of working with different sensors, um, do a lot of audiovisual work, um, being synesthetic. I basically see sound in my mind as different shapes and forms and uh, different behaviors and personalities. So I, I tie that into my work as well. Um, I do installations, I do live performances. So I try to combine all these elements that interest me into one, obviously working with science um, as well and tying that into it to make it experiential um, and virtual re reality and doing different workshops and other such things. So that's an example of some things that I do as an interactive experience designer, and that was all from just last year. So a little bit about how I got to where I am now. Um, when I went to college at UCF, University of Central Florida, um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do because growing up, everybody always told me that you can be creative or you can be technical, but you can't really be both. And I heard this all the time that you're kind of one or the other, and that didn't really feel right to me because I definitely had an interest in both sides. And so um, when I was in college, I actually, it took me a while to figure out that you actually had to pick a degree and you had to decide what you wanted to do because I would take computer classes that interest me. I took foreign language classes that interest me. Um, I took some art classes that interest me. Um, but then they said, you have to pick what you major in. And then I didn't know what to do. So I was hoping through the book and then I finally saw digital media and some of the courses were, you know, exploring different software like Photoshop and things like that and doing um, electronics and physical computing. And so that interested me on the technical side. 
Uh, but then the output of it was creative expression, you know, doing these artistic things, but using different technology to realize those uh, artistic endeavors. So through that, then I got to actually combine those two things together and realize that you don't have to pick a side, you can actually merge those together. So um, if you're interested, actually that picture that I, I used in the background, that's something that I created that's 100% code. So that's not 3D modeling, that's actually 100% uh, faded with code that describes the lighting and describes the textures and everything is code based that created that image. Um, so right out of college, I didn't know for sure what I wanted to do after that. And so I took some time where I worked at Full Sail for 11 years teaching digital media, exploring different interests. And that really allowed me kind of a safety net of getting a steady paycheck um, teaching digital media while I explored all these interests on the side. So um, I worked a lot with cymatics, which is the study of the phys physical vibrations of sound. So um, the thing that I loved about it was that I could explore different aesthetics, but it was based on the physics of sound and so um, this is actually a photograph using water sound vibrations um, and capturing it with different exposures and so i did a lot of work with that and exploring the physics of sound vibrations um, working with different systems i had an interest in math and language and so um, some of my own projects i would create different languages um, and exploring you know if we didn't have the language that we have now what is the ideal systematic language that makes the most sense I did things like that with number systems and uh, with color systems and basically rethinking the systems that we use today. Uh, here's another one that I created. Uh, and then I got into uh, creative coding and doing a lot of work with that and creating geometric forms. So I was really interested in math, but using code to generate these forms. Um, here's another example of drawing that. Um, and that got me into thinking about interactivity because I was doing all these things that I loved, but I actually wanted to put it out there that other people could play with. So that's when I started to get into interactivity. And then from there, that's where we are today. So um, all of that stuff went into the work that I do today. So working with sensors, working with code, um, having a creative visual output, working with sound. And so these are some examples of different uh, shots of performances that I did. And for all of these projects, I work as an independent uh, interactive designer. So I left my job teaching two years ago and I do this independently full time. And so I do all the sound design, all the programming, um, all the concept design and implementation and everything that goes into it. So for each project, I have to learn new sensors, new programming languages, and a lot of new uh, things. And that's what I love about it is that there's always something new. So for every project, uh, these are just some of the things that go into everything that I do. So every project might be a mix of, uh, you know, thinking about the psychology of play and, and what engages people in interacting with it, uh, integrating different electronics, uh, artificial language or artificial intelligence, uh, VR, AR, things like that. So these are all examples of things that go into my project. So basically, at the end of the day, just do what you love. So that's what I'm doing now is combining the things that I love. Well, thank you for that, Ginger. That was very interesting. Okay, so next we are going to Dr. Juliet, Julieta Aguilera. So Julieta studied design at the School of Architecture, the Catholic University of Vesperio in Chile. She owns two Masters of Fine Arts in Design from the University of Notre Dame in Electronic Visualization from the Electronic Visualization Laboratory at the University of Illinois at Chicago with an emphasis on virtual reality and a focus on shared spaces. Because of these research interests, Julieta took a job at the Adler Planetarium Space Visualization Laboratory where she created or contributed to scientific visualizations for exhibitions and planetarium shows. Julieta eventually became the associate director of the laboratory, working alongside Adler astrophysicists, educators, and administration staff, as well as astrophysicists from various universities. She handled weekly, presentation on, weekly presentations on how scientific visualization and current technologies are used to explore, study, and communicate scientific discoveries and theories. While at Adler, she also spearheaded events geared to advance the understanding and integration of immersive and collaborative interactive media. She has taught the full design curriculum as well as graphical interfaces, immer immersive environments, and scientific visualization. While com completing her doctoral dissertation with the Planetary Collegium, Collegium at the University of Hawaii, sponsored by the Academy of Creative Media and hosted by the Emolia Planetarium. I apologize for butchering that. Julieta has participated in various conferences related to art, science, and planetariums. 
So after that long introduction, let me go ahead and welcome Dr. Julie. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Yes, you butchered some of the words. <laughs> A lot <laughs> of them. It's okay. <laughs> so um, let me go ahead and share my screen too. Um, see. Should be the green button down at the bottom there. No, no, I got it. Let me start my slides to make sure they do work. Oh. Let me see. Share. Okay. Oops. You don't see it, Luis, do you? Yes, we see your screen. You see the, the slide? Yes, we see it now. Ah, okay. So um, these are some pictures of the School of Architecture um, that, that I attended at the Univers uh, Catholic University of Valparaiso. And I came to uh, the STEAM field from my interest in space. Um, I, at school, I work, um, I had an art magazine that I ran. I ran a poetry magazine that made it to the National Library in Chile. Um, and I uh, did a lot of scenography. I gathered a group of friends and we did a lot of interactive scenarios where things were kind of kinetic and introduced people to a platform where they did the presentation. So it was always about uh, interacting with the space and kind of the body in, in there doing things. Um, and this school particularly has an emphasis on, on a space at, at that level. We had a, a class called uh, Body Culture, which did things like this, where you had to pre uh, construct uh, devices that mediated the body in a space. So uh, this is what you see in these pictures. Uh, then I went on to study uh, graphic design, uh, a master of fine, fine arts in graphic design, uh, but I did take lots of classes in, in the sciences, in anthropology, in history of science, uh, cosmology, um, which also interests me. Besides film classes, at the time, there wasn't that many interaction classes. Um, there was one uh, on how, uh, programming in Flash, uh, at the time, but then uh, I went up back to, start to, to teach design for a couple of years, and then I went back to get another Master of Fine Arts, and what you see here is uh, a piece I designed in the cave in, uh, that is a grid of tesseracts of four-dimensional cubes, and uh, that was because of that interest in, interest in mathematics and and moving space. So what you see here is you're, I'm there rotating this uh, four-dimensional grid. It's, a, it's really a three-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional grid. So because it's 4D, the, the notion of uh, time, you know, I have to move to see the four dimensions, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, I took a class on math that that's how I ended up doing this project. Uh, also at school. So I was taking, again, classes. I took a class, uh, classes on linguistics, psychology, in this math class. And then after I finished that, I, there was an opening at the, at the planetarium because they were looking for someone uh, to uh, be in this, to collaborate with in this space visualization laboratory. So of course there's the dome, it's very immersive. Um, but I got to do things uh, where I was explaining other kinds of immersion to our visitors and our um, staff. You know, things like augmented reality. I invited a couple of friends, Todd Margolis and Tracy Cornish, to curate a virtual exhibit inside the planetarium. So here, one of the artists, Brenda Silva, uh, she designed and she created this uh, uh, strange attractor roller coaster ride in our 1940 model of the moon. Um, 
So, you know, to kind of challenge the space. And other, other things that I did in this case, uh, we collaborated, uh, my colleague and I collaborated with another uh, astrophysicist um, in doing a poster for the, uh, for an SF competition, the big thing, the various ways, various ways that uh, you can represent the cosmic web. And uh, the astronomer, the astrophysicist, he came to us and said, how can I put my visualizations together? And I, very, I did a very simple poster in a way, but we won the competition. And this is the laboratory where I work for a few years. Uh, this is the Space Visualization Laboratory. And as you see, plenty of devices, touch screens, 3D stereo, uh, high resolution uh, devices. Uh, and we had people come in and out, and sometimes there would be an astronomer talking about astronomy. Sometimes there would be someone like me talking about scientific visualization and explaining why what you see, it's real, but it's not realistic. So that always fascinated me. And the reason, I should say the reason I took the job at the planetarium was because of that challenge where we have, we are presenting space in so many sensory rich ways that of this reality that is beyond what we can experience as simple human beings, but not, not simple. So I did uh, things like visualizations of modeling models. So this is a, um, a model from uh, her, uh, Herschel, where he Im imagined what the Milky Way looked like as a Planck model. You know, he said the reason it looks like a band in the sky is because it's really this kind of brick construction. Uh, and then I made this animation to show what, what, how he imagined that. But that's something that we do in the dome. This is another image from the uh, right where he imagined that the Milky Way is really uh, stars sitting on a sphere. So we still build these models and the, all these models are attached to our body and our experience of our life on Earth. Um, so that's what drove me. So I came to, uh, to STEM, to, to STEAM, to, to, to working with scientists because of his fascination with space. And I think at the time I didn't know that I was gonna work in scientific visualization. I just love space. So uh, I think that many of the things that people may be doing in 10 years will be careers that don't yet exist. And I think that's why it's important to follow that drive um, to, uh, to reach that, that point where you realize, oh, the vision I had, the call I had, uh, was something that I didn't know yet, but I had this passion that guided me. So I think that's, I agree with the three presenters that that's what the drive should be. And uh, it's been beautiful for me and I hope it's beautiful for you guys. Oh, this is a piece, uh, I don't know if you can see my screen, uh, I'm working with pottery these days and doing kind of haptic, colorful visualizations of cosmic things. So in this case, it's kind of like a supernova. Um, so another thing I did, I should mention, I, I worked in, at Iniloa Planetarium for a year in a one-year position. Um, and uh, something that was uh, very interesting is I got to collaborate with a ceramist and a 3D and a green maker who did 3D printing. And, we work on a class where we had the students work on the 3D models in ceramics, touching with their hands, uh, and then scan them and then print them in different color, different uh, sizes. And then my section, which was the virtual reality section, my, my challenge to them was for them to make the model that they had created with their hands so big that using the vibe, uh, VR goggles that they could either walk or uh, walk over or walk through their models. And I continue this idea that, you know, we live in a space and that is fascinating to me as you see here. 
Well, thank you for that. Um, that was really interesting. And I've actually been to the Space Visualization Lab in Chicago, and I can attest to how amazing it is. And the pictures don't, don't do it justice, for sure. Well, the video that you saw, that was a, a, a time lapse that I asked Jose Francisco Salgado, who's a, my fellow astronomer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I asked him, you know, he's done all these time lapses of telescopes around the world. And I told him, why don't you do a time lapse of our laboratory? And it was such a different scale for him to do. Um, we don't think out. of this, but we are looking at accelerated visualizations of how, you know, uh, galaxies don't move very uh, fast in comparison to us humans, or they move very fast, but it's hard for us to perceive that. Uh, but, you know. It was fascinating to see that motion through our laboratory to, to show people to sh how, how many things happen there, um, which is the same thing that you do when you look at visualizations. Exactly. Of, so the sun and such. Okay, so let me go ahead and introduce our sixth panelist tonight, Ms. Joan Melendez Meisner. Uh, since the Central Florida Astronomical Society was lucky to have her come speak at our meeting a couple months ago, and I was lucky enough to meet Joan in person. So I'm very happy to see you again, Joan, virtually. Uh, let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about Joan. Joan received her dual Bachelor of Science degrees in Chemical Engineering and Chemistry from the University of Maryland and Towson University. She received her Master of Science degree in Systems Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School. Joan is currently working as a systems engineer for Blue Origin, working on the orb orbital New Glenn rocket, which is being manufactured at Cape Canaveral, Florida. As a systems engineer for Blue Origin, Joan defines the requirements for which the, for which the rocket shall be designed to, which also includes the launch pad, recovery ship, and payload requirements. Additionally, she works to define the verification testing activities that must be performed to validate the design of the rocket. Joan volunteers throughout the community and is fully involved with STEAM outreach programs, including judging robotics competitions, mentoring middle and high school age students, and participating in the women in math events. She, is also, she was also chosen to be a part of the DOD's 30 Under 30 promotional video which, aired at rate, which aimed at raising awareness about STEM career opportunities among college students studying STEM. Most, most recently, she was selected to be a NASA Solar System Ambassador, which focuses on public engagement efforts, efforts to communicate the science and upcoming NASA events. NASA has also, Joan, excuse me, Joan has also recently applied to be a NASA astronaut for the 2021 cohort. So let me go ahead and welcome Joan. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Right. Awesome. Um, well, I mean, I really can't say much else. That was a, such a great introduction, introduction Trish. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick and let me know if you guys um, can see it. Can you guys see my screen? No, we cannot see your screen. So I'm just going to go ahead and talk. Um, sorry about that. So um, as Trisha already mentioned, um, I have a dual bachelor's degree in chemistry and chemical engineering. Um, I also have a master's in systems engineering, and um, I've been a I've, I'm a, I've been a systems engineer for about eight months now. So that means I'm an expert at uh, Blue Origin and Rocket Science. So if you guys have any questions, uh, please ask me, but I'm just kidding. Um, oh, sorry. Am I good to share now? Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Are we good? We can see it. All right, cool. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm from Orlando, Florida. I was born in uh, Panama because my, my father was in the army. Uh, my family's from Puerto Rico, which makes me the red sheep of the family. I'm the only one that was born outside of Puerto Rico. Uh, so my hobbies, I like to, uh, I love music, so I like to play the piano, the clarinet, and the guitar. I'm also very active um, pre-COVID, so I can't really go play outside and play sports, uh, but I usually like to play tennis, basketball, and softball. 
Um, I'm also into photography and videography. And as uh, Trisha mentioned, I love volunteering in the community. Uh, some interesting facts about me, I was an extra on House of Cards and Veep. So if you guys ever want to know what scene I was in, if you blink for a split second, you will not see me, but I was walking in um, in front of uh, Princess Bride. So that was pretty cool. Um, I was on a carrier for about seven days and I was able to be catapulted off uh, the ship, which was such a great experience. This is that top picture up here. Um, and then I also met my favorite astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, and then I was also an intern on Capitol Hill for the House Majority Whip in Maryland. So I've been all over the place. Um, I've tried to do as much as I can because I love politics. I love, um, you know, volunteering and I love STEM. So uh, next, my work experience, um, I started off with Naval Air Systems Command, uh, NAVAIR. I was really um, lucky to start there because I've met so many great mentors. I've met so many great people who uh, geared me towards my career. Um, so I started off as an intern and then I was accepted into the Pathways program. So what the Pathways program is, is they pay for your last two years of college and you have a guaranteed position uh, in the Department of Defense, so NAVAIR at the time. So I'm just really thankful for the people that I was able to meet and get me um, to, ha to help me with pay for my college at the end of my career there. Um, and then recently I was at Air Force Base Command, which is now Air Force Space Force. Uh, I was there for about three months. It was a really short stint because uh, Blue Origin called me and, you know, I, I can't say no to Blue Origin. So, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, left Air Force Base Force and I started working at Blue Origin as a launch integration engineer. Um, and like I said, I haven't looked back. I absolutely love it. A uh, little bit about Blue Origin. Um, we are working on, in Florida, we're working on the orbital rocket, which you can see over here, uh, which is super tall. It's going to be a little bit shorter than the Saturn V. So if anybody is a huge space nerd, um, the Saturn V was about 110 meters. This is going to be about 98 meters. So it's just a little uh, short. Uh, this is our suborbital rocket. We're working this year towards uh, first human flight. So I'm really hoping that um, I'll be selected one of these days as a Blue Origin astronaut. And so I'd be able to go into space in this little capsule. Um, and then just for scale, this is a human down here. It's not really anything like that, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's for scale. So that's, that's me right there. Um, and then, like I mentioned, this is the uh, rocket right here. Um, so it towers above the Falcon, the Vulcan, the Atlas, anything that's currently going to space right now. Uh, so ours is just uh, slightly, slightly uh, less tall than the Saturn V. And then if you want anything for scale, that's the um, Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty. So from the base to the top, our rocket is going to be taller than the Statue of Liberty. Um, so, you know, I, I, I got into STEM because um, I first wanted to be a doctor. So as many other people here, you didn't really, I didn't really start off at STEM. Um, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to help people. Uh, but then I entered at a hospital and I saw blood and I almost passed out. So I immediately said, I can't be a doctor. Uh, so I talked to my guidance counselors and I had really good guidance counselors in college. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they put me on the path of engineering and math and science because I already took a lot of those classes. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned, I went to the University of Maryland and Towson University. It was a dual degree program. And for my master's, I went to Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, NAVAIR was actually the, uh, the company that paid for me to get my master's while I was in, while I was working full time. So that was a really good opportunity. Um, I've been very lucky and blessed throughout my career. Um, and I, and I, I don't know if I've mentioned this enough, but mentoring is really big for me because I had a lot of good mentors along the way, uh, right before. Um, I moved down to the Space Coast. Uh, I had a mentor up in Maryland. Uh, I met her because I was volunteering at an event and she was an F-18 pilot at the time. She was super nice and, you know, we hit it off very well. And I, you know, met with her a couple times. So she was a really good mentor. Uh, we lost touch back in uh, 2012. And the reason we lost touch was because she was selected to be an astronaut and uh, she is Miss Nicole Mann who is going to be going to uh, space on the Boeing Starliner. So um, like I said, I've had really good mentors along the way. That's why I like to volunteer in the community and I like to be a mentor to everybody else because um, I'm very humble about the people that were put in place in my path to be where I'm at. So I definitely want to give back to the community and uh, be a mentor and you know, uh, help the next generation build rockets. Thank you for that, Joan. That, that was pretty amazing. Okay, so last but not least, let me go ahead and introduce our last uh, panelist here. So Nicole Penn. Nicole is a technology producer specializing in 3D environmental design and development and digital media. 
She works at EA in Orlando, Florida as a development, development manager on Madden, one of the top selling video game franchises in the world. Nicole has a particular interest in the art, structure, and mechanics of video games, AR, VR, and the new mixed media using advanced technology. She has over six years of professional experience in software production management and layers of supplementary experience in the form of personal R&D and design production support for game development in Unity, freelance project work, hackathons, and game jams. Before joining EA, she worked as a producer of augmented reality software at Magic Leap, supporting production in Magic Leap Studios, audio, art, animation, production R&D, and interaction systems. In her free time, Nicole likes to contribute to Orlando Tech and Arts initiatives as a board member, supporter, or volunteer. She has been actively involved with the Indie Nomicon, an association for independent game developers. Also, Startup Weekend, the We Venture Women's Business Center, Orlando IX, Florida Technology Journal, the Orlando Tech Association, and others. She has helped to plan and run annual Orlando game jams, including Global Game Jam, Indie Galactic Space Jam, and sports and health tech events. She has also volunteered for the Orlando International Fringe Theater Festival and the Maker Fair Orlando. So thank you again for coming out, Nicole, and I would love to hear your story. Hello, I've got to shorten that bio, I think. <laughs> Hi, how's everybody doing? Um, I work as a development manager at EA, that's Electronic Arts, it's a video game studio. Um, it's a global studio, a global company, but the studio that I work for is to grow on here in Orlando. Um, I could do a quick screen share here. I have a couple slides. Um, the work that I do is not really conducive to slides. Um, so I'll just kind of do a, a quick overview. So I also, like many of the people here in this panel, did not start out in technology. Um, I definitely fell in love with my computer at first sight, that was a fact. Um, but I didn't actually own a computer until I got to college um, because I worked my way through school and, and bought it with, with my own money. So um, it, was, it was a little late getting started. Originally I thought I was gonna get into digital media. So I took some digital media classes my final year at UCF um, and I started making games around the same time um, except that it wasn't actually video games. The games that I was making was, uh, they were transmedia entertainment. So alternate reality games, they were called. So this is like way deep down a, a serious nerd hole. Um, and it's like a kind of an improvisational real time uh, game that happens in the world, but there are puzzles and clues and websites and videos and things. And it's the, the concept of transmedia is basically this idea that the internet seamlessly connects all forms of media. So you can go easily, you can transition smoothly from a video to social media, to a website, to whatever form of media. And it's, it's, all, it's all a very seamless narrative experience. So you can tell a story that uses different types of technology. So that kind of combinatory technology um, was a core part of my own personal creative evolution. So, um, you know, video games obviously are a combination of, you know, your uh, initial character art, your animation, your, um, you know, uh, your special effects, visual effects, so characters, rigging, and that, that idea of bringing together all of the different art forms into one medium, I think is, is very interesting. So I, before I worked at EA, I worked at a company called Magic Leap, which is an augmented reality company. And this is a particular interest of mine. I'm a researcher and kind of a hobbyist designer of augmented reality experiences. Um, so augmented reality, in case you don't know, is you know VR, you put the headset on, all you see is the new virtual digital world around you. Um, augmented reality, you're looking through the glasses, through the lenses at the world around you, except you have digital objects placed in your environment. So this, this brings a lot of different kinds of concepts like uh, location-based art and real-time art. 
um, or experiences, learning experiences, education, healthcare, architecture, they're using it for all sorts of applications these days. So that's a particular interest. Um, this is one of the, the games that I worked on while I was at Magic Leap uh, Project Create. Um, I was inspired by location, other location-based games, augmented reality games that you can play now on your phone, which is kind of where this technology exists commonly. So this is an, an evolving art form right now um, and an evolving technology. Uh, so in terms of the hardware, the hardware is changing very quickly. So Magic Leap is, is technically available, um, but it is uh, not wide, widespread right now. Um, so I was also inspired by other types of advanced technology that use sensory experiences. So this is an experience called The Void which is a virtual reality experience that happens in um, uh, kind of like a maze space. So they, they use a physical space and they use things like heat and they use, um, oh, sorry, um, they use heat and smell and uh, sensory, other sensory elements to enhance the experience and enhance the feeling that you're actually there. So this idea of the combina combinatory experience is really interesting. Um, I was, I got started um, really doing this creative from a hobbyist perspective um, at Urban Rethink. So I, I got out of school, I was managing the website for an arts nonprofit company, and I wandered into this co-working space one day. And that's, I met a professor who was doing work in transmedia design for entertainment. So that was my first job working in uh, transmedia and uh, game design, and that was very exciting. Uh, I was I followed a lot of different projects. This is one I did uh, called Sherlock Holmes and the Internet of Things, and it was rethinking traditional storytelling with new technology and new forms of media. Um, I got involved in an organization called Indianomicon. Uh, I was a board member for many years. I'm still a volunteer. Uh, we put on local game jams, global game jam. Uh, the Indie Galactic Space Jam is a big one. Uh, this is Indie Namicon. And yeah, that's, that's probably a pretty good introduction. Well, thank you for that, Nicole. Um, so what we're gonna do now is, Deborah has a couple of slides uh, to show. So Deborah, if we can shoot back to you, and what we'd like to do now is to talk a little bit about um, you work in mentoring. Um, you had mentioned in previous discussions that you are a big proponent of mentoring. And why don't we talk a little bit about how important that is to you and your work and what you guys do. Okay, thanks, Tricia. So I'm just going to try to share my screen again. Hold on. So what I wanted to do is just give you an example of um, an experience that I had mentoring someone. So um, just six steps that I kind of came up with, and then I'll, I'll share with you a little story that I have about um, one of my mentees. So I think you probably, um, every, we're all kind of saying the same thing, <laughs> that we started out not necessarily knowing what we wanted to do, and we followed our passion. So I feel this is number one. So finding your passion and how do you do that? You, you have to explore, you have to try stuff, you have to say yes to things, and eventually you find something that you love, and then you seek out people who believe in you. So um, once you find your passion and people that believe in you, focus your energy on that. So focus is really important, and I've had some stumbles along the way. Um, you have to ignore the negative energy and just pursue what you believe in. Seek help, ask for help um, when you need it. Um, demonstrate commitment. So to me, as a mentor, there's nothing more attractive than a student who has a good work ethic and says, I really wanna work on this project, I'm committed to it, I'm on board. 
And then um, when things get tough, go back to step three. So I think focusing, finding your passion and staying around people that believe in you is really important. So this is a picture of one of my former students. She was an honor student at Seminole State a while ago. And um, she led environmental outreach on campus. And she pursu pursued an opportunity to conduct research at a national lab. So she was at um, Oak Ridge National Lab between her freshman and sophomore years. Then um, she was offered an opportunity to present her research in a poster competition. So she entered this poster competition and she won. So it was amazing because here we were from Seminole Community College at the time and um, there were students there from MIT and Ivy League schools and she just shined. So um, she pursued her passion and she focused, she asked for help. So um, through her, I learned about opportunities for other students um, at National Labs. So um, we're running um, short on time. So um, let me just share with you why I'm telling you this story is because her earning this award at the poster competition gained a lot of publicity for our school. So our foundation approached me and said, would you mentor other students? We have an opportunity to um, request a grant from a company called the Atkins Foundation. So they awarded me this grant for women in science. And so what I did with it was I designed this class called Travel Studies in Biology, uh, Women in Science. So as part of this class, we've done it two times now in the um, summer terms, May of 18 and May of 19. And as part of this class, we went to museums, national parks, Los Alamos National Labs, and um, the outcomes were amazing. So um, with a few thousand dollars, we were able to take this trip with females who are interested in science careers. We visited other colleges. So this is Santa Fe Community College. They have a solar array there. And um, quite amazingly, we have, uh, this mentorship has resulted in two Jack Ken Cook scholarships for the girls that traveled. So Haley Furman is in this picture. So she won the Jack Kent Cook scholarship last year. And in the next picture, um, Emily Gearhart in, on the left, she went back to pursue an internship at uh, the New Mexico Consortium, um, which is a very, it's, a, it's affiliated with Los Alamos National Labs. And she had a great experience doing research. And Daliana Garena on the right, she was a Jack Kent Cook scholarship recipient this year. So all this in large part due to their experiences and inspiration on these travel study trips. So I'm happy to report that Trishel is now at Iowa State University majoring in material science and engineering and she will earn her PhD this summer. Um, so just starting with a, a student who exhibited initiative and she's paved the way for other students. So um, this is what, what really makes teaching rewarding. So thank you, Tricia, for allowing me to share the story. Sure, Deborah. So why don't we just have a conversation and go back and forth and we can talk a little bit about um, maybe how mentorship was important to us. We can talk about how, what science means to us. We have a pretty eclectic group here on the panel. And so we have a couple people here that are taking their love of science and their passion of engineering, astronomy, space, and they're able to, like, like when it comes to the space and science visualization, they're able to merge the art and the science. And an art or a science like astronomy is very hard to experience because it's so far away. A science like physics is very hard to experience. But what Ginger is doing, what Dr. Julie is doing, um, they're trying to merge and create an, an experience where everybody can actually be immersed in both science and art. So if we want to um, talk a little bit about that, Ginger or Dr. Julie, um, let's go ahead and do that. Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, so 
one of the things that I love doing, as you mentioned, is finding ways to make science experiential. And so since I love science, it kind of naturally feeds into what I do. So um, just to give an example, I showed the cymatics earlier, which is the uh, physical sound vibration. So um, what interested me in that is the, the physics side of it, mostly the science, but also that there's a visual interesting geometric component to it. So um, I actually created a permanent installation for the Orlando Science Center where people can uh, interact and change the frequency and amplitude in real time with a sensor, basically playing it like a theremin, moving their hand up and down and visualizing the geometric output of the physical sound vibration. So there's an art component to it where they're actually seeing that, but they're controlling the sound and the amplitude and seeing in real time how they can actually see the water inside of the uh, physical structure to see it moving up and down and then it's projecting. So they learn about you know, how physical sound moves and then turns into these periodic uh, motions through like wave, wave mechanics and things like that. So that's one example of there's a, a teaching component, a learning component, and understanding science, but there's also an art component to it of it is something beautiful. It creates these geometric, uh, very beautiful visual patterns based on the science behind it. That's neat, Ginger. Um, so what would you say, for instance, if a young person came to one of your performances and they came up to you and they said, you know, I'm a music person. I love music through and through. I love this whole immersion of music concept that's developing right now, but I'm also in love with physics. I'm also, yeah. you know, I'm an amateur astronomer. Um, how can I fulfill a passion and potentially maybe one day make a career out of merging? You know, wh where do you see uh, this, this whole notion of the art and science immersion Inter, you know, is it entertainment? Is it education? Where it's, it's definitely a spectrum. So um, for me, I like bringing science in where where it's not straying too much from the science itself. You know, there's a there's a translation component where on one end it can be 100% art that's inspired by science, and then of course on the other end it can be 100% science that's inspired by art or vice versa. So there's, it's definitely a spectrum. Um, if somebody's interested in sound, but they're also interested in physics, then one thing that's really big is sonifying data. So taking data and then translating that to sound so that people can hear, auditorily experience data from, let's say the planets or from other things, or translating the data from the planets into geometric patterns and things like that, because there is a lot of things that, depending how you interpret that data, you can understand it in different ways by seeing the geometric patterns or by seeing it translated into visual things. So um, there's, a, there's a spectrum between being inspired by science but then mostly doing art and then you know keeping true to the science and wanting to really get the message across and interpreting the data so that people understand the data itself. So there's definitely a whole spectrum there that people can fall anywhere in between depending where their interests lie. Yeah, I would like to... I would like to add, you know, to what Ginger is saying, I totally agree um, that the, the irony in having worked, you know, for so many years in planetariums and looking at things that are so far and so slow for us to perceive that it kind of makes you revise, it turns onto yourself as to how do I sense the world that is actually close to me? So mm -hmm. actually by looking at things that are really far away, I, it has come down perhaps to learn more about how we humans are, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for example, to what she's talking about, if you sonify the movement of the planets, everything's happening so slow that you have to speed it back very quickly to even make it audible. So, you know, like 20 hertz is the lowest human hearing range. So a lot of times, all of that data, you have to speed it up so quickly that you can perceive the hearing of it, but that's, you know, like billions of years probably of movement that's actually translated into maybe 10 minutes of sound. Yeah, I, I talk about tailoring things to our senses, you know, because in astronomy you do that with color too, like mm -hmm. all the, like infrared and, and x-ray and gamma rays, and now we're seeing these things that are invisible to us because they are, we're kind of sliding the color uh, spectrum to fit what we can actually perceive, so yes. Mm -hmm. 
And it's those aha moments too of like, you know, once you translate it to other things, sometimes for people that may be more, uh, more auditory, auditory learners or more visual learners, it's when they see it in that form that it makes sense to them. So that's why bringing art into this is really interesting because when you translate it into those forms, a lot of times that's when people understand it. You know, maybe they've learned it their entire life a different way, but then they see an artist's representation of it that, that takes the true data and just presents it a different way. And then that's when it makes sense to them. I think it's always a question of the human experience, right? Like the, the technology, the science is the, the tool, the process, the mindset. And then from there, it's what do I want to learn? What do I want to know? What do I want to feel? How do I want to experience what, you know, whatever it, whatever the topic is, whatever, whatever I'm focusing on at the time. But in the end, it's always what am I trying to get out of it or share as, as a human? And Nicole, can you talk a little bit about your experience um, in EA? And again, trying to merge, merge your passion of science with, you know, you're a gamer girl, you're a tech, you're a computer. So how do you, what does that merging look like? Yeah, so I've, I've played around with a lot of different types of technology in, in multiple areas of science, I would say, like less the physical sciences, but um, things like projection mapping and sensors and electronics and in addition to a video game, a computer. Um, and for me, it's, it, we, you know, we use this buzzword called immersion, and it's the degree to which you are uh, emotionally, intellectually involved in what's going on around you. And so video games try to achieve a degree of immersion where you are in the game, you, are, you, you have some sense of presence, even though you are not physically present. And then the other technologies I've worked with in the past, like virtual reality is meant to fully immerse you. So you are, you are taken out of your reality and put into a new reality that is all around you. Um, and so the, the level of immersion increases. And then you have the augmented reality, which is, is meant to keep you where you are and you have a sense of your physical space and your, your actual reality, but you are adding a, a virtual component to that whatever that means, whatever you decide to do with it. So it's a new design paradigm in that you have to decide why is, what, what type of, of media, what form of media is better in augmented reality versus in virtual reality versus in video games versus, you know, going back in a book or in a play or, or whatever it is, how are you presenting that information to, to convey a certain, um, you know, uh, intent. So with a game, games are by nature learning experiences. So they are teaching you something, your coordination, your finding skills, uh, your puzzle solving skills, um, strategy. So you are in addition, so there's a kind of head, hands and heart uh, component to it where you are intellectually involved, you are emotionally involved and you are, you are physically responsible for making things happen. So that's, it's one of the reasons why I think the, the virtual media is, is so interesting. Uh, but I, I think that answers your question. It does, thank you. Um, and so it seems that this is kind of where the, the future is going as far as education. And so I'm thinking that it's gonna be very beneficial for, for students that are going to be learning the sciences and even music and the arts in the future. Um, trying to, to merge the educational aspect of these through the visualization, through the immersion, immersion through the things like the Science Visualization Lab. Um, case in point, my little nephew, who I've been trying to teach astronomy to, when he went into the Science Visualization Lab, the fact that he was able to you know, touch the table and see the lights and he was able to experience astronomy in a much more, we use this word so many times, immersive way, um, he was able to connect some dots that he previously had not. So I would like to hear from some educators on what they think uh, about this, this immersion educational platform and what it means to be um, maybe teaching science through this AR VR world. Sure, I'll step in. Hey, it's Professor Nesser again. <laughs> um, 
So one grant that we were actually working on last fall that we ended up pushing it for a year to apply for it and now everything's shut down. <laughs> so we're not working on it anymore. But it was this idea, it was not my idea, but I was invited to work on the grant with them, the grant application. And it was going to be an NSF grant to uh, develop courses using an augmented reality platform. And there's a professor, Chris Lorscher, who works for Seminole State College. He was one of the principal investigators listed, and he was going to try to make physics modules where you put on your, I guess it's virtual reality <laughs> instead of augmented, you would put on a virtual reality headset. And nowadays you can get them, you know, very basic ones that you attach to your phone. So that was the idea for the grant that, you know, it's like a lab fee for the students to get that. And he was going to have basically these interactive modules where you could move, you know, axes on a graph and look at the way things interacted. And then on my part, I was going to try something earth science related. So I, one of the courses I teach is astronomy and there's already a ton of interactive simulations. There's, I think it's called Universe Sandbox is a really fun one to click around on. And it's trying, you know, you're not wearing the headset, but it's trying to really let you interact with, you know, far away things. And I wanted to try something more geology based because that's my experience. So I was planning on maybe going into the center of the earth, you know, like digging a mine into the center and seeing what you encounter or, you know, ex being inside of a hurricane or something like that with meteorology or inside of a tornado so you could see what is happening. Um, unfortunately, the grant is on hold right now, but it's still an idea to combine, you know, immersion with science. So one of our biggest questions when we were meeting to discuss this grant was, who is animating? I cannot animate someone boring a tunnel into the center of the earth. That is not something I know how to do yet. Maybe I can learn. Um, so we were also just talking about how necessary it is for something as simple as developing a course like that, that we would need expertise outside of the sciences. You know, there is no way that just a geologist like myself was going to be able to put together a virtual reality course. Um, and then as far as students go, like Debbie had mentioned, I really just try to encourage, you know, putting everything into every course you're in, regardless of if it's the thing you're most passionate about, where, you know, like Debbie said, I took random courses in college that they really rounded out my education, even though they weren't science based, you know, even a psychology course I found really useful. I took, you know, a little funny wines and vines <laughs> where we learned about the geography of wine you know just like these things that once you pick a passion you is for education at least you do not have to only do that one thing i always try to tell students you know if they complain about a requirement <laughs> that they don't see as being useful i try to kind of mention oh it will be useful you might not see the use but it will be useful, you know, accounting or something like that. Um, but yeah, so in my experience, I found that just developing materials as an educator has to be a lot more immersive than just scientists working on one thing together. Thank you for that, Laura. So let's go ahead and bounce over to Joan and Zoe. I'd like to switch gears for just a second and talk about space. And I'd like to ask you both, um, you're, you're both into mentoring, you're both into inspiring the next generation of space scientists and engineers. And so I'm curious, for instance, if little Zoe and little Joan could go back in the time machine that maybe somebody's gonna invent, and you could go meet a younger version of yourself, say maybe middle school, high school, what would you guys say to either each other or your little selves when you guys were younger? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'll jump in. I think I would say if I could talk to my younger self, I think I would, I would say, um, you know, that it's physics, you know, you'll be interested in physics someday and don't be discouraged just because uh, physics classes and math classes are, are challenging. You know, I think 
Um, you know, that was, I think it's a struggle for a lot of students. Like you take your first physics class and it's hard because, um, you know, physics is hard when you're first learning it. It's a different way of thinking. Um, and I think it's really easy to get discouraged because, you know, you think like, well, if I don't get this immediately, then I guess I'm just not, that's not how my brain works. Um, so I would, I would go back and, and tell myself like, you know, it's okay for things to be, um, to be an intellectual challenge and just look at it as, uh, as fun, picking up these new skills. Um, I think that would have saved me a lot of, uh, a lot of stress. <laughs> So uh, tell me how you ended up at UCF and what you guys are doing over there at the, um, with the small bodies research and also with the asteroid regolith, the lunar regolith and all of the space dirt that you guys play with. Yeah. Um, yeah. So UCF has really become, uh, has become a, a powerhouse of, uh, of planetary science research and especially small bodies. So comet um, and asteroid science. Um, uh, it's, uh, we have several, there are several scientists at UCF who are part of the, the NASA OSIRIS-REx um, science team. So that's the asteroid that's in my background here is Bennu, which is currently being studied by um, the NASA mission OSIRIS-REx. That's where this picture came from. Um, but yeah, we have, there's, there's a lot of uh, small bodies research happening at UCF. So one of the things I'm involved in is, uh, is Exolith Lab. So Exolith Lab, uh, we make fake space dirt. <laughs> um, and what do I mean by that? Well, let's say you are uh, an aerospace company and you're building your Mars rover and you wanna test your Mars rover to make sure it's not going to get stuck. Um, you want some Mars dirt uh, to test it in, but it turns out you can't just like it's not cheap or reasonable to actually haul dirt from Mars back here just to test your rover. So you want to you want fake Mars dirt that is uh, very 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 close to uh, real Mars dirt. Um, and so that's what we do. We um, uh, I'm the so I'm the chief scientist at Exolith, and we have so we have the science um, we have the science part of it. We have the engineering part of it, um, and we make space dirt, Mars dirt, asteroid dirt, moon dirt, um, that is uh, as close to the real thing as you can get uh, here on Earth. How would I go about getting some of this Mars dirt? Ooh, you can email me. Um, you, can, you can visit our website. So if you just Google Exolith, E-X-O-L-I-T-H, um, you, can, you can get it. We have it for educational purposes, research. Um, it's a nonprofit organization. Um, so yeah, just hit me up. I can I can hook you up. <laughs> okay, so for everybody watching, um, we're gonna post Zoe's contact information. So if any educators or any DIY families, uh, any parents looking for uh, science experiments for their kids, any homeschoolers, uh, contact Zoe, and she will help you get your hands on some space dirt. Uh, so. Joan, we lost Joan for a second, but we have Joan. Glad, you know, glad we didn't lose you. Um, so Joan, let's talk a little bit about what your advice is to young people that would like to go into space, potentially even explore Mars or the lunar surface. So I know that you're really big on Mars. Um, I'm more of a moon person, <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's a great time to get involved in science and, um, you know, specifically space just because you have, you know, these private companies like Blue Origin, SpaceX getting involved w working with NASA, uh, you know, two weeks, actually in about nine days, we have the Demo 2 launching, which is uh, astronauts from uh, American soil once again. So that's a really exciting. But uh, for those who want to go to space, um, you know, STEM degrees, um, you know, I, I recently just applied to be a NASA astronaut and the qualifications is you need a master's degree in STEM, uh, you need two years of experience or a thousand hours of uh, flight hours. Um, 
but you know they, they always look for that X factor, that uniqueness um, that you can bring to the table. Um, so. Uh, uh, you know, um, doing human exploration uh, research analog missions with NASA. Uh, those are 45 day missions, uh, which I'm, I'm currently a finalist to get accepted into that program. Um, so, you know, there's, if you want to be a NASA, NASA astronaut, um, you know, you can go down that path. But the cool thing about these private companies being pulled together is, um, you know, they're going to be a lot more opportunities to go to space um, with those private companies, specifically Blue Origin. You know, we're working on our new Shepard capsule. Um, hopefully we're going to be, we're working Working towards uh, first human flight this year. Uh, so those are going to be open for everybody. So space is going to be access accessible for everybody in the near future. Um, you know, you could be a blue astronaut, you can eventually be a Virgin Galactic astronaut, um, you know, ULA, all these companies are going to have these opportunities for folks to go to space. Uh, so you not necessarily have to be a NASA astronaut to go. And I'm really excited for that next chapter in our space exploration. That's really exciting, Joan. Yeah. When do you uh, when do you hear back next? Uh, so right now, so there's about twelve thousand applicants to be a NASA astronaut. Um, that's so, it. Yeah, that that's it, right? Um, so you know, from there they they uh, they look at your resume, they uh, contact your um, your the people that you put as a as uh, people to speak for you. Um, and so from there, they're gonna pick about 400 and um, then they're chosen to go for a phone interview. From there, I think they choose about less than 50 folks to go to in an in-person interview. Depending on COVID-19, it may also be a virtual one. Um, but okay. from there, um, we're hoping to hear back by the end of this year, but it's not gonna be announced until 2021. Wow, we will be uh, waiting with bated breath. Uh, and me checking too. in, <laughs> and uh, hopefully uh, we hear some good news. Yes, hopefully. Okay, <laughs> so apparently, yes, fingers, both fingers crossed. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, we have a question for Ginger. So could you give us a backstory on your finger? What's going on there? Yeah, so I mentioned that I had a magnet in my finger earlier. Um, I did do that intentionally. Um, I'm interested in tapping into things that we wouldn't normally be able to experience. And so uh, the magnet in my finger is a small neodym neodymium magnet that allows me to feel electromagnetic field. So essentially what it does is with an electromagnetic field, it responds with a magnet and so it essentially vibrates in my finger. So I was trying to find something spurious that I could demonstrate. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Oh right. my gosh. Yeah. So, um, it is actually pretty strong. I pick, pick up up to uh, like a full lighter, basically weight wise, to give you an idea of how strong it is. Um, but my favorite part, so obviously there's party tricks, uh, but with the electromagnetic field, it's really cool because um, anything that has an electromagnetic field, you can actually feel the scope, the strength of the field around it. So you can even use it to like troubleshoot, like if electronics are working or if they're about to go bad, things like that. So it is something that I, enjoy on a daily basis is just basically like a six sense. And does it hurt? Are there any side effects or? Um, the side effects, sometimes you get stuck to things that you didn't know. If, you, if there's like metal uh, shavings on the floor, you might get them stuck to your finger, which is kind of fun and silly. Um, the side effects are all good things usually. Um, I haven't had any issues with it. Basically, when I got it put in, very small incision, they put it in, I got a single stitch, and then after about a month, it healed up. And if the, um, the person that asked about it, they're more than welcome to email me if they have questions about it or where to get it done. They can definitely contact me. Did you get it done locally? Yes, I did. Interesting. Yeah. Is there a specialist? Yeah. So it's, it's important that you get it done by somebody that knows what they're doing. Uh, because there are people, of course, that, that try to do it very cheaply or think that they can do it. And there's, um, so the one that I have actually uh, was um, injection molded and it uses, uh, was it Perlene C? So we're talking science now. So perlene C, which is a medical um, sealant that keeps your body from breaking it down. And so uh, you definitely have to get it done the right way with a professional and a professional magnet. Otherwise, you might have issues. Huh. Yeah. But I love it. This is so interesting. We didn't have a, a whole show just on the finger. <laughs> Actually, uh, at UCF, I used to do talks, uh, not so much anymore, but I used to do a lot of talks on biohacking and uh, talking about ways to enhance our senses and experience the world around us through biohacking. Fun times. Yeah. Fun times. Um, so let's go ahead and start to wrap up. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. 
I really appreciated hearing not only your backstory and how you got to where you guys are now, but also I think it's important to have these conversations between women that really love science and also art and the visualization aspect and to at least be discussing these topics and hopefully these conversations for further conversations. And if not people contacting you for us to potentially have another conversation, maybe branching off. Uh, Cause there are a lot of interesting topics here and we just don't have the time or the bandwidth, Joan, <laughs> we don't have the ability necessarily to, um, to cover all of these topics. So I really hope that this maybe uh, generates further conversation. And I would like to ask all of you, all the panelists, if you have anything you would like to throw out there, um, mainly any, any piece of advice you would like to tell a young person right now that is interested in science and is not quite sure maybe how to go about pursuing their passion or interest um, or anything of the sort. So I'm going to open it up and does anyone have any closing remarks? I, I think that um, if I may jump in, um, I, I uh, coached a number of people when I was at the at the Adler and at the Space Visualization Laboratory. Many of the astronomers had like a art side of, to them. So I think uh, if anything, do not think that because one is pursuing a career, uh, other interests are uh, out of the out of, of the question. Um, another thing that happened to me a lot when I was at the Adler is like uh, my colleagues would come and say and ask me, "Why do I like this?" You know, and it, it is. Uh, I think we're at a crucial time to understand how our uh, aesthetic appreciation is actually part of our perception and thinking, and what other panelists have said. Thank you for that. I would jump in here and say, uh, just go and do something. So we ran some maker programs for a while and the transformation from, you know, a middle schooler who had never uh, accessed a, an area of learning before and they would just get their hands into it and they would just start making something. Um, from from when they started doing that to when they had something completed and done it there's there's a change that happens there when you realize I can just do it I can just find a, a project that's a good beginner project get the equipment find the resources and there are tons of resources available online that'll teach you any of these areas of sciences at every level um, and make something or, or learn something or do something or, or go out and, and study and, and research, uh, you know, an area of physical science, but just getting started, I think, and, and having something completed and done is important. Yeah, and I'll add one more just for um, students that are in classes that maybe interest them, but they haven't really thought much more about it please don't be afraid to talk to your professors. <laughs> we live for you to stop by during our office hours and tell us what you found interesting or tell us about a video you watched that you do not understand what was going on. Um, you know, in class, I'll have some questions that I don't know the answer to. So I'll say, let me look into it. And I make a little note. And then the next class, I start with the research. And I say, here's what I found out. And you know, I think that a lot of students that are interested are worried that they'll get shut down. You know, if the teacher's busy, maybe it's happened before where they email a teacher and they never receive a response. But, you know, I would just say, please engage with us. We really, really, really love when a student seems interested, if you stay after class, just to say, I really love this one thing you said. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But um, one way, if you're thinking about, you know, advanced degrees or job opportunities is you need to develop a rapport with professors, especially for letters of recommendation. So don't be afraid to kind of engage outside of class. If you feel nervous approaching a professor one-on-one, -on -one, send them an email first. 
today we have Zoom, so you don't even have to worry about stopping by someone's office, you know, request a quick Zoom session. Excuse me, it's a quick Zoom session. So I just want to emphasize the importance of once you do find your passion and if you want to keep advancing in it, make sure to keep lines of communication with your current professors or current mentors, if you have them already, make sure to keep the communication open. Yeah, I, um, I'm just gonna jump in real quick to second that. I think that's like amazing advice. Um, and also if you, you know, if you're, if you're a student um, in, in a course and you find that you're struggling, um, talk to your professor right away. The thing, like when I've taught, the thing that always breaks my heart the most is when I hear from a student at the end of the semester and they're like, oh, this, this class was so rough for me and I struggled so much and I, my grade is really bad and this is gonna ruin my scholarship and what can I do? And when it's, you know, when it's time for grades to be due, there's nothing else they can do. So don't wait, you know, it's, most, most of your professors are gonna be just super happy that you're reaching out and asking for help. So go to those office hours, you know, ask about your homework. If there was an exam that didn't go well, go over it. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask for help. <laughs> and don't think that a bad grade means we don't like you. <laughs> it's okay to fail at something if you didn't understand it. It's just important to make sure you follow up on that. So please don't, I know I've had students that maybe they had a poor performance on the first exam and they kind of shut off, you know, but it's much better if you open up and say, hey, you know, once you've, you know, if you have a poor performance on something, teachers are, that's what we're paid to do, to help lift you up and teach you in a way maybe that you could better understand it. Thank you for that, Laura. Deborah, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I just think that absolutely, I agree with all that. <laughs> and thank okay. you, Tricia, for moderating us. Well, thank you guys for coming out. I think it was a good talk, and I appreciate hearing, and I, I actually, I appreciate hearing most how everyone is has similar store, backstories, even though everybody's coming from such different places. So I really appreciated your time. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it back over to Derek and we're gonna close out. So thank you again, guys, very much. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Trisha. And of course, thank you to our wonderful panelists tonight for joining us for our Women in STEAM virtual panel. And I can tell you right now, based on the messages, uh, and things that we've been receiving online, you have made a difference tonight to somebody. So I wanna appreciate all your time and all your effort to come out and join us this evening and uh, doing what you do and doing what you love. So again, thank you very much. Uh, for those that are uh, interested, we do have a couple of things I wanna mention here. Uh, we do have some programs the rest of this week uh, for you to enjoy if you like this, stick around and of course uh, subscribe to our Facebook page also and to our YouTube page, we're gonna be uploading this to YouTube. So for anybody that missed out on the Facebook Live, uh, we'll be adding this to YouTube so you can share that with additional people. Spread the word, right? That's what we're here for uh, to, to do that. Uh, this Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we're gonna be joining um, two other planetarians. We have uh, Shannon Schmall from the Michigan State University's Abrams Planetarium and Tiffany Wolbrook from the Youngstown Planetarium uh, at the Youngstown University in Ohio. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and talk about Chilean skies. Uh, what you can see in Chile. And Julie, uh, you are from Chile, right? Isn't that, isn't that your home? Uh, isn't that where you're, you're originally from? Yes, most beautiful country. Uh, most beautiful, uh, yeah. I, actually, uh, Tiffany, Shannon, and I, uh, we're part of an ambassador program in Chile. We're going to be talking about some of our experiences, some of the science going on, some of the incredible things. And so I'm sure, Julie, you can attest to the fact that it's just an incredible night sky from that location. Uh, well, it's the driest desert in the planet, supposedly. So, yes. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. If you ever get a chance to go, definitely do it. Uh, and then at uh, this week, we actually have a special event going on at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. We're actually going to be joining with the Smithsonian's uh, Astrophysical uh, Observatory, as well as other 
uh, observatories and astronomers from around the country. And we're going to be doing a national star party, virtual star party in the planetarium in the Center for Astronomical Society. Me, Frank, and Justin will be joining on that. So really exciting. This is actually going to be on YouTube. Uh, we'll be posting the link to that later on on our Facebook page. So don't miss out on that as well. It's going to be very exciting to get a chance to do some stargazing all around the country. So with that, again, thank you very much to our panelists. Uh, thank you, Tricia, for moderating this. You, you did a great job as our captain steering the ship tonight. Um, so with that, I hope you all have a great rest of your evening, and we look forward to seeing you all in a future virtual session in the future. All right. So take care, everybody. Bye. Thank take you. Take care. <laughs>